Congregation, turn your hymnals to page 76 and rise up because it is time for the Brainworms podcast. Amen! Hallelujah! I'm Joe. I'm David. I'm Kane. And I'm Chris. And the spooky fucking month of October continues. <laughs> Hopefully forever because it is the best month. And our epic spooky crossover with our partner podcast, Butcher Block, continues with our reading of Something Wicked This Way Comes by Ray Bradbury. I'm so excited for this. Yeah, yeah, it's going to be good. If you're interested in a deep dive of the film that was based on this book, then go over there. and It should be available everywhere that we are, and check that out. Because today we're reading Ray Bradbury, Something Wicked This Way Comes. Ray Bradbury, very popular, successful science fiction fantasy writer, very influential, kind of brought that genre to the mainstream. Got kind of weird and conservative in his later years. Was he the guy that did Ender's Game? No. No, no, that was Orson Scott Card. Who was also Also another very weird weird and conservative, yeah. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Um, Because because never meet your heroes is basically... if, If this author influenced you as a young person... They they probably became a monster at some point. You know, I'm I'm not gonna like go too deep into it, but I I can look it up on my own time. But I somehow missed Ray Bradbury getting monstrous. Oh yeah, he got real right wing. Oh no, I'm sorry to hear that. Like extreme, pretty yeah. Uh, he called Charlton Heston a genius. Oh. Oh. Yeah. Is that it? <laughs> it's like, I mean, I there, mean there's that's, more. That's, that, 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 okay. I feel, but I feel like that summarizes it. Uh, right. Not, not right. for me, um, just for our listeners. Who's Charles Heston? Um, he was in the Planet of the Apes. He was. Get your damn in... dirty hands off of me. Yep. Um, and oh! then he also became. Soylent the... Green is people. Yeah, he, he was a very successful actor in the. And White Moses. He was White 60s Moses. 60s and 70s. And then he became a weirdo. I, and then I remember he became that. The, the head of the NRA. And yeah. Right. Um, and, and, and I don't want to dig too deeply into, yeah. into Ray Bradbury's politics because it makes me sad. But, but yeah, he got, he got very right wing in his mm-hmm. later years. But he is one of my all time favorite authors, actually. Oh, God, I've, yeah. I've Absolutely. Long been a big fan of Ray Bradbury. And this is a rare opportunity for me to read a book that I have read in the past, not for. Uh, it's been a long time. I read it when I was like 15, and it l- left a profound effect on me. Oh, hell so, yeah. um, a lot of his stories were yeah were very influential in my in my early years. Mm-hmm. I just want to point out that I think it says a lot about an author that they can do both science fiction and fantasy. Oh yeah, no doubt. Although, if you want your childhood ruined, I do have a very unfortunate quote of his from 1994. <sighs> Uh, I guess we have to go down that road. Uh, An interviewer asked him, how does the story of Fahrenheit 451 stand up in 1994? To which he replied, and and I'm sorry to the listeners, it works even better because we have political correctness now. Political correctness is the real enemy these days. The black groups want to control our thinking and you can't say certain things. The homosexual groups don't want you to criticize them. It's thought control and freedom of speech control. Okay, so I've changed my mind. I don't want to. I don't want to do something wicked this way. Comes. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I didn't want to walk through that door, and then, and then I found that quote on the Wikipedia page. Well, at least we can all comfortably and confidently say, "Fuck Ray Bradbury." I'm glad he's dead. Well, he was, he was, he was just an old man. I mean, you no. know, d- no, uh, I mean, that that's kind I, of I, a cop out. There are older people that aren't horribly right wing. It's true. No, I, I or don't. just boldly racist and homophobic. <laughs> sure. Well, <laughs> you guys, you guys know the saying, you either die the hero or live long enough to see yourself become the villain. It's true. <sighs> that's, that's not the same thing. It's not the same thing at all.
because chances are Ugh. Ray Bradbury was always a racist homophobe. Oh, yeah. sure. He just didn't feel comfortable coming out and saying right. it until he was old. Yeah, I, I threw up in my mouth a little bit <laughs> reading that, that quote. I feel really unclean now. Yeah, like I said, fuck Ray Bradbury. I'm glad he's dead. All right, and that's the end of the podcast. Never Thanks, everyone, that. for coming to listen, and have a great rest <laughs> yeah, of your day. Yeah, we're done. <laughs> that's it. We're out. Uh, that was nine minutes about why Ray Bradbury kind of became a monster in his later life. Yeah, I think I think well, we should have left that just, out until the end. It just makes me sad. Yeah. Uh, we should have left that out to the end because now it's just I have to the whole thing. Yeah, I have to listen to a thing I truly enjoyed as a kid and reread as an adult and still loved it. And now I have to reread it through the eyes of now, this is this is a great exercise in separating art separating art from the author. Literally the author is dead. Right. Yeah, the, this is a great exercise in just considering the work right. in its own merit. Yep. I'll try not to have any like weird descriptions that he gives be colored by what I know his opinions on people to be. Right, right. Yeah, hopefully, hopefully, yeah, that doesn't taint the, the reading. But yeah, death of the author is strongly in play here. Indeed. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he's fucking dead, guys. <laughs> fucking dead fuck you ray bradbury so yeah if you like what we're doing dear listeners dear congregation of brainworms, then you can interact with us directly through social media through our youtube comments if i you know if i think you have something cool to say i'll probably respond to it um i will i will certainly talk to you through dms or comments on facebook we're happy to talk to listeners are you gonna slide into listeners dms is that what you're saying no, I want them to slide into mine. <laughs> because that's where that's where the worm spores are. What? Um, I have an extensive folder of David's feet pics <laughs> that I am happy that. to distribute. Yeah, I, I like I like that bit. I think it's funny. Uh, <laughs> and I mean my feet are pretty feet. awesome. Um yeah, and you know, if you want to support the show and help it grow, tell your friends, tell tell your neighbors, hey, man, I, there's this podcast, and I really like it. These guys are lovely and charming, and and they're really they tell the funny jokes, and and they help me become a better writer with their literary criticism. <laughs> or you should, if you should you, also, <laughs> or if you hate our guts, uh, recommend us to someone you hate. Oh, look at these fucking assholes mob their comment section because we hate them like yeah that's fine we, we welcome that but yeah that that absolutely helps the show grow and if you want to support the show in a monetary way then we have a patreon and all of those things can be found at our lovely fancy pants website we give you brainworms.com it is a pretty fancy website it's a very nice is, website yeah it's a, it's a lovely site yeah whoever put that site together they deserve a hand job i don't like foreplay i just like my daddy's just go straight in wait what that's okay i'm sorry did, let's, did uh, i say something not, <laughs> let's not pursue that please continue <laughs> yeah so what are we reading <laughs> uh, we're reading something <laughs> wicked this way comes yeah i know yeah I'm just trying to redirect the conversation here i was going with the redirect you you fuck Prologue. First of all, it was October, a rare month for boys. Not that all months aren't rare, but there be bad and good. They're not. They're as not the that rare. They, they happen once a year, every year. Yeah, it's a uh, it's one out of twelve. Take September, a bad month. School oh begins. fuck you! <laughs> hey man, wake me up when September ends. God damn it! I know. <laughs> Consider August, a good month. School hasn't begun yet. July, well, July is really fine. There's no chance in the world for school. June, but no it's so doubting hot. it. It's so hot. June's best of all, for the school doors spring wide and September's a billion years away. But you take October now. School's been on a month and you're riding easier in the rains, jogging along. You got time to think of the garbage you'll dump on Don't Old Man Cricket's porch or the hairy ape costume you'll wear to the YMCA the last night of the month. Uh, how, does, how does Ray Rat Bradbury know about what I do on Friday nights? <laughs> and if it's around October 20th and everything's smoky smelling and the sky orange and ash gray at twilight, 
It seems Halloween will never come in a fall of broomsticks and a soft flap of bed sheets around corners. Hey, hey, Chris. Hmm. Hey, Chris. What? Um, I, I notice a lot of your comments revolve around you wearing various animal costumes. Yeah. Um, we've been doing this show for a while, and you you pretty regularly reference how you like to wear animal costumes. Do you want to talk about that? I have no idea what no, you're talking about, officer. Keep- Keep <laughs> keep reading, David. Just ignore the man behind the curtain. Who happens to be wearing a unicorn outfit. Just ignore that. But one strange, wild, dark, long year, Halloween came early. One year, Halloween came on October 24, three hours after midnight. At that time, James Nightshade of 97 Oak Street was 13 years, 11 months, 23 days old. And he just happened to have the coolest, edgiest last name. Yeah. Next door, William Halloway was 13 years, 11 months, and 24 days old. Both touched toward 14. It almost trembled in their hands. And that was the October week when they grew up overnight and were never so young anymore. This is such good prose. Chapter 1. The Seller of Lightning Rods arrived just ahead of the storm. He came along the street of Greentown, Illinois in the late cloudy October day, sneaking glances over his shoulder. Somewhere not so far back, vast lightning stomped the earth. Somewhere, a storm like a great beast with terrible teeth could not be denied. So the salesman jangled and clanged his huge leather kit in which oversized puzzles of ironmongery lay unseen, but which his tongue conjured from door to door, until he came at last to a lawn which was cut all wrong. No. Not the grass. The salesman lifted his gaze, but two boys far up the gentle slope, lying on the grass. Of a like size and general shape, the boys sat carving twig whistles, talking of olden or future times, content with having left their fingerprints on every movable object in green town during summer past, and their footprints on every open path between here and the lake and there and the river since school began. Man, life was boring before the internet. (laughs) (laughs) It's true. Before the invention of Nintendo. (laughs) Man, just carving whistles out of twigs. Yeah. And it actually sounds kind of fun. I'm not going to lie. I I would love to have have an afternoon free enough to just go and do that. Just whittle. Yeah. Yeah. It it does sound like a pleasant thing to do in October. Right. I might go do that today after we record here. I probably won't. (laughs) Howdy, boys, called the man, all dressed in storm-colored clothes. Is the door-to-door salesman a cowboy? The boys shook their heads. Got any money yourselves? The boys shook their heads. Well, the salesman walked about three feet, stopped, and hunched his shoulders. Suddenly, he seemed aware of house windows or the cold sky staring at his neck. He turned slowly, sniffing the air. when the sky stares at my neck. I know, right? He turned slowly, sniffing the air. Wind rattled the empty trees. Sunlight, breaking through a small rift in the clouds, minted a last few oak leaves all gold. But the sun vanished, the coins were spent, the air blew gray. The salesman shook himself from the spell. The salesman edged slowly up the lawn. (sighs) Gotta stop taking drugs on the job, salesman. (laughs) (laughs) I mean, it's the only way you're going to get through this. Yeah, it does sound like a pretty tedious job. Boy, he said, what's your name? And the first boy, with hair as blonde white as milk thistle, shut up one eye, tilted his head, and looked at the salesman with a single eye as open, bright, and clear as a drop of summer rain. Will, he said, William Halloway. The storm gentleman turned. And you? The second boy did not move, but lay stomach down on the autumn grass, debating as if he might make up a name. His hair was wild, thick, in the glossy color of wax chestnuts. His eyes, fixed to some distant point within himself, were mint rock crystal green. Don't talk to strangers, kids. At last, he put a blade of dry grass in his casual mouth. Jim Nightshade, he said. He saves his professional mouth for Sunday. (laughs) (laughs) The storm salesman nodded as if he had known it all along. Nightshade. That's quite a name. And only fitting said Will Halloway. Since I'm training to learn the ways of the katana. (laughs) (laughs) I was born one minute before midnight, October 30th, 
Jim was born one minute after midnight, which makes it October 31st. Halloween, said Jim. By their voices, the boys had told the tale all their lives, proud of their mothers, living house, living house next to house, running for the hospital together, bringing sons into the world seconds apart, one light, one dark. There was a history of mutual celebration behind them. Each year, Will lit the candles on a single cake at one minute to midnight. Jim, at one minute after, with the last day of the month begun, blew them out. So much Will said excitedly, so much Jim agreed to silently, so much the salesman, running before the storm, but poised here uncertainly, heard looking from face to face. Halloway. Nightshade. No money, you say? The man, grieved by his own conscientiousness, rummaged in his leathery bag and seized forth an iron contraption. Take this free. Why? One of those houses will be struck by lightning. Without this rod, bang, fire and ash, roast pork and cinders. Grab! The salesman released the rod. Jim did not move, but Will caught the iron and gasped. Don't give children lightning rods. They'll impale each other. (laughs) (laughs) That's not always the case. Sometimes they'll just stab each other gently. That's fair. Just a little poke. Just... (laughs) A little jabby jab. Boy, it's heavy. Give a little poke and then, and that's my play for the day. (sighs) Man, I'm tired. It's like a, you know, eight-year-old cat. (laughs) (laughs) Boy, it's heavy and funny looking. Never seen a lightning rod like this. Look, Jim. And Jim, at last, stretched like a cat and turned his head. You can use it to summon the Dark Lord, son. (laughs) (laughs) His green eyes got big and then very narrow. The metal thing was hammered and shaped half crescent, half cross. Around the rim of the main rod, little curlicues and doohingies had been soldered on later. The entire surface of the rod was finely scratched and etched with strange languages, names that could tie the tongue or break the jaw, numerals that added to incomprehensible sums, pictographs of insect animals all bristle, chaff, and claw. The fucking old one summoner (laughs) for real (laughs) that's egyptian jim pointed his nose at a bug soldered to the iron scarab beetle hey kid you like cthulhu (laughs) (laughs) so it is boy jim squinted and those there venetian hen tracks right why asked jim why said the man Why the Egyptian, Arabic, Abyssinian, Choctaw? Well, what tongue does the wind talk? What nationality is a storm? What country do rains come from? What color is lightning? Where does thunder go when it dies? Boys, you gotta be ready in every dialect with every shape and form to hex the St. Elmo's fires, the balls of blue light that prowl the earth like sizzling cats. I got the only lightning rods in the world that hear, feel, know, and sass back any storm, no matter what tongue, voice, or sign. No foreign thunder so loud, this rod can't soft talk it. I think this salesman's been smoking the reefus. (laughs) (laughs) Is this person being racist toward the thunder? (laughs) Toward Toward the weather? Yeah, it's impossible for me not to think about that now. I never would have before, but... Yeah, uh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry to to all of our listeners who now can't look at Ray Bradbury the same way again. Don't we save our apologies till the end of the episode? Sometimes it's worth opening your presents early. <laughs> it's a good point. Especially if the present is me. Open the package up. Tell me what's inside. Jesus, man. Go find sex. <laughs> <laughs> I can't. I'm on the moon. There's nothing go up here except sex. craters. Go, just go, go out and go find and sex. Look for it and find it and have it uh, and leave us alone. <laughs> really you've sorted yourself out. Yeah. Craters go aren't this... sexy enough. I don't. I don't get it. <laughs> Trust me. Just put on your unicorn outfit. Go to the closest honky tonk. You'll find somebody. Yeah. Put on that that mesh tank top we talked about. <laughs> <laughs> there are and the unicorn that, outfit. The, a, a unicorn outfit and a mesh tank top would go over real well in some Fucking clubs. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Preferably like a leather biker club. I mean, probably. That, that's yeah. not going to get you where you want to go. Yeah. It might. No. It would definitely make an impression. <laughs> yeah. 
If where you're trying to go is the hospital, then <laughs> yes. Well, I can run faster than bikers, Kane. Just <laughs> they have just, motorcycles. Yeah, I was going to say they have fucking motorcycles, Chris. I have the speed of the majestic unicorn. Just watch Pee Wee's Big Adventure and you'll figure it all out. It's fine. <laughs> Go find sex is my favorite thing you've ever said. <laughs> <laughs> it is pretty good, David. Go find sex. <laughs> what were we? What were we talking about? But Will was staring beyond the man now. Which he said, "Which house will it strike? Which? Hold on. Wait." The salesmen searched deep in their faces. Some folks Fucking draw what? lightning, suck it like cats suck baby's breath. Wait, what? What's happening right now? Some folks' polarities are negative, some positive, some glow in the dark, some snuff out. You now. If I were sitting on my lawn the two and a salesman you, started talking this shit to me about cats call sucking baby breath, <laughs> about the, the, the weather speaking a language, like get away from me you are a sketchy person i had a great aunt that was terrified of cats uh -huh. because she firmly believed that they tried to steal your breath really? yeah I, that was a yeah, fairly common that, sort of folk wisdom that thing. folk tale yeah, yeah. but I, I didn't know that that anyone genuinely believed it yeah we had to actually lock my cat up whenever she was going to be over because she would hyperventilate and like lose her fucking mind wow i i've genuinely never heard of this what are you guys talking about it's a old old wives tale basically just sort of a bit of um I don't know where it originated but it's definitely an Appalachian thing. Yeah, absolutely. Um, that cats will like steal suck your, your breath, breath. Uh, typically mm -hmm. while you're sleeping they'll yeah, you know, they'll crawl up on they'll, your chest. Yeah, they lay on and, your chest. Yeah. Um and they just breathe in and steal your breath while you're sleeping and sometimes people say that's it, it's one of the ways that they explained crib death I think. But yeah, yeah, so there you go. That's one thing that Ray Bradbury was extraordinarily good at is the man was basically an amateur mythologist. Like he, mm. he knew a lot of mythology, a lot of folklore, and did an incredibly good job of incorporating it into his writing. Oh, yeah. What makes you so sure lightning will strike anywhere around here, said Jim suddenly, his eyes bright. The salesman almost flinched. Why? I got a nose, an eye, an ear. Both those houses, their timbers, listen. They listened. Maybe their houses leaned under the cool afternoon wind. Maybe not. Lightning needs channels like rivers to run in. One of those attics is a dry river bottom, itching to let lightning pour through tonight. Tonight, Jim sat up happily. No ordinary storm, said the salesman. Tom Fury tells you, Fury, ain't that a fine name who won, for one who sells lightning rods? Did I take the name? No. Did the name fire me to my occupations? Yes. <laughs> Grown up, I saw cloudy fires jumping the world, making men hop and hide. Thought, what a strange man. I'll chart hurricanes, map storms, then run ahead, shaking my iron cudgels, my miraculous defenders, in my fists. I've shielded and made snug safe 100,000, count them, God-fearing homes. So when I tell you boys you're in dire need, listen. Climb that roof, nail this rod high, ground it in the good earth before nightfall. But which house? Which? asked Will. The salesman reared off, blew his nose in a great kerchief, then walked slowly across the lawn as if approaching a huge time bomb that ticked silently there. He touched Will's front porch newels ran his hand over a post, a floorboard, then shut his eyes and leaned against the house to let its bones speak to him. Then, hesitant, he made his cautious way to Jim's house next door. Jim stood up to watch. The salesman put his hand out to touch, to stroke, to quiver his fingertips on the old paint. Yeah. <laughs> this, he said at last, is the one. Jim looked proud. It moves like they do. <laughs> Without looking back, the salesman said, Jim Nightshade, this your place? Mine, said Jim. Don't tell him where you live. No. no. <laughs> yeah. This, this, do not. <laughs> Stranger danger. If there are any 13-year-olds listening to this podcast, 
Well, Stop probably it. don't. You're grounded. You're but absolutely grounded. Tell your parents what you've done, strangers. especially that other thing you did. We know. <laughs> We're watching you. <laughs> From the moon, we have the moon. telescopes. And a telescope in front of telescopes. No, no, we don't. We don't. That's a no, lie. we have satellites. Yeah. It's not the 1950s. All right? We don't need <laughs> fucking telescopes. All right? I just but, Google Earth. <laughs> But in the 1950s, or whenever this story was taking place, that's a good question, actually. When was this story taking place? One moment, please. I might be able to tell you that. Or at least when was this published? Because it was probably meant to be... Right, present day. Uh, 1962. Okay. So we can assume this was somewhere between the 40s and 60s in its sure. setting, which checks out. Yeah, it feels, feels right. Yeah. Uh, without looking back, the salesman said... Jim Nightshade, this your place? Mine, said Jim. I should have known, said the man. Hey, what about me, said Will. The salesman snuffed again at Will's house. No, no. Oh, a few sparks will jump on your rain spouts. But the real show's next door here, at the Nightshades. Well. The salesman hurried back across the lawn to seize his huge leather bag. I'm on my way. Storm's coming. Don't wait, Jim boy. Otherwise, bam. You'll be found, your nickels, dimes, and Indian heads fused by electroplating. Abe Lincoln's melted into Miss Columbia's, eagles plucked raw on the backs of quarters, all run to quicksilver in your jeans. More. Any boy hit by lightning, lift his lid and there on his eyeball, pretty as the Lord's prayer on a pen, find the last scene the boy ever saw. A box brownie photo, by God, of that fire climbing down the sky to blow you like a penny whistle. Suck your soul back up along the bright stair. Um, Get, boy. Hammer it high. Um, you're dead. Come dawn. It's a, yeah, that's a hard sell there, guy that's giving <laughs> this thing away for free. Yeah. I'm, uh, I'm getting some needful things vibes here. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And jangling some is, phrasing vibes. Some phrasing vibes, yeah. Yeah. And jangling his case full of iron rods, the salesman wheeled about and charged down the walk, blinking wildly at the sky, the roof, the trees, at last closing his eyes, moving, sniffing, and muttering, Yes, bad, here it comes, feel it, way off now, but running fast. Quick question. Yes? If we were casting a movie based on this, would you guys cast... Christopher Lloyd or Patrick Stewart for the salesman? Will Friend Arnett. Of the show Willem Dafoe. I, I I think it's fun that we both went with Wills, mm -hmm. but very different ones. Yeah, I I concur with Willem Dafoe. I think that would be a pretty good fit. I yep. think he would do a good job. Yeah, I, I immediately went to Will Arnett just because I think he could do a good job of having that sort of weird, off-putting but animated. Sure. And with, I don't picture this the, guy as being quite border. so old. Yeah. Right. I would go with Royal Dano. Royal who? Who? Royal Dano. I don't think I know who that is. That's who I would go with if I wanted to do like, a, if I wanted to cast the, the lightning rod salesman. Mm. Mm. Is that who plays him in the film adaptation? It is. Okay. It is. Okay. <laughs> God fucking damn it. It's, it's, way to call that out. Well done. <laughs> Cross pollinating. <laughs> Proud of you. <laughs> so you see, we're preparing for the uh, Ray Bradbury extended universe. You no, laugh. We're not. That that was an Ray actual Bradbury. thing. That was uh there was a show called Ray Bradbury Presents where they Oh yeah, I remember that show. Made live action adaptations of a lot of his short stories. I think the ah. sci fi channel showed reruns of it. Probably, yeah. Uh, right. I'd like to remind everyone that I'm glad Ray Bradbury's dead. <laughs> Yeah. But I'm also glad that he lived because even though he died as a, and probably lived as a racist piece of shit mm. and homophobe and overall just general, like just the conservative worst. nightmare of a person, uh, he was also a hell of a good author and a great fantasist. Um, yeah. Like I know I'm kind of obligated to make sarcastic comments, but it's really hard to resist the temptation to just sit and listen. Yeah. Yep, because I, this prose right is so you. good. Like, it's, it is. It's, it's really well done. Mm -hmm. And jangling his case full of iron rods, the salesman wheeled about and charged down the walk, blinking wildly at the sky, the roof, the trees, 
at last closing his eyes, moving, sniffing, muttering. Yes, bad, here it comes, feel it, way off now, but running fast. And the man in the storm-dark clothes was gone. His cloud-colored hat pulled down over his eyes, and the trees rustled, and the sky seemed very old suddenly. And Jim and Will stood testing the wind to see if they could smell electricity, the lightning rod fallen between them. Jim, said Will. Don't stand there. Your house, he said. You're going to nail up the rod, or ain't you? No, smiled Jim. Why spoil the fun? Fun? You crazy? I'll get the ladder. You the hammer, some nails, and wire. The fire is so much fun. I just like looking at fire, and I wonder, where could I spread it to? Oh, so many places. Everything burns. <laughs> fire is the devil's only friend. <laughs> But Jim did not move. Will broke and ran. He came back with the ladder. Jim, think of your mom. You want her burnt? Will climbed the side of the house, alone, and looked down. Slowly, Jim moved to the ladder below and started up. Thunder sounded far off in the cloud-shadowed hills. The air smelled fresh and raw on top of Jim Nightshade's roof. Even Jim admitted that. Yeah, really, really excellent starting chapter. So good. Um... Chapter 2. There's nothing in the living world like books on water cures, deaths of a thousand slices, or pouring white hot lava off castle walls on drolls and montebanks. The fuck you say? So said Jim Nightshade. That's all he read. Jim Nightshade's a weird person. <laughs> Jim Nightshade Don't be friends with him. is a weird person. He is uh, not your average 13-year-old boy. I think he's a fucking changeling. <laughs> so said Jim Nightshade. That's all he read. If it wasn't how to burgle the First National, it was how to build catapults or shape black bumper shoots into lurking bat costumes for Cabbage Night. God, I'm not sure I understand a single <laughs> world. I, I'm really not sure I understand a single word of that entire sentence except catapults. Yeah, like shape black bumper shoots into lurking bat costumes for Cabbage Night is so evocative, but I have no idea yeah, what the yeah, fuck I it means. That... Like maybe in, in 1960, then then it meant something very specific that has kind of faded into obscurity. Sure. I sure. just, oh, oh, no. Okay, I've got the key to solve this mystery. I mean, if we knew what a bumber shoot was, that'd be a place to start. Um, we'll just, just consider this cabbage night. You know, maybe it's the devil's cabbage night. They're just getting real stoned? Yeah. <laughs> okay, I'll, I'll buy yeah, it. Sure. That, yeah, that holds water, yeah. I mean, I don't think that's the case at all. I think they're going to boil cabbage and the whole neighborhood's going to stink. But Why would whatever, you celebrate you know? that? Like, hey, we're having cabbage night. Because it's, it's the late 1950s <laughs> and what else do you have? I and wonder if uh, cabbage, cabbage night like, is boiled like... Boiled cabbage is delicious. Boiled is, cabbage is hell. delicious. It's yeah. so good. And so is fried cabbage. Like cabbage Corned in general cabbage. is just... Yeah. I, I'm, I'm a fan of cabbage. Yeah, yeah. me too. Maybe Cabbage Night is another name for Devil's Night, like the I'm night gonna, before I'm gonna, Halloween. I'm going to look it up. Yeah, yeah. Uh, a term for the night before Halloween used in Vermont. Okay. So, so I yeah. mean, honestly, it's... that then sets a time and a place for this story. Sure. Just by using that one, that phrase. Yeah, it's Devil's Night, Gate Night, Goosey Night, Moving Night, Cabbage Night, and Matt Night. Man, hmm. can you imagine people in Vermont reading this book and like get reading that and they're, and they're like oh man he knows about cabbage night <laughs> although i will say that he specifically said that this was taking place in greentown illinois that's true maybe so he grew up in vermont we or something got you ray bradbury <laughs> <laughs> taken Fuck out you, of the I'm story glad you're completely dead. taken out um, completely it's just lost my uh entire <laughs> like voice of the author completely ruined no reliability remaining i'm kidding Clearly. Apparently, the the origin of that phrase, and having grown up around rural people, this scans uh, children who lived in rural areas would go and steal rotten vegetables from fields and chuck them at people and oh, places, yeah. and and property. Yeah, that as definitely a, as a scans. whimsical prank. Yeah, <sighs> fun. Jim breathed it all out fine, and Will he breathed it in with the lightning rod nailed to Jim's roof. Will proud and Jim ashamed of what he considered mutual cowardice. It was late in the day. Supper over, it was time for their weekly jog to the library. 
Like all boys, they never walked anywhere, but named a goal and lit for it, scissors and elbows. Nobody won. Nobody wanted to win. It was in their friendship they just wanted to run forever, shadow and shadow. Their hands slapped library door handles together, their chests broke track tapes together. Their tennis shoes beat parallel pony tracks over lawns, trimmed bushes, squirreled trees. No one losing, both winning, thus saving their friendship for other times of loss. So it was on this night that blew warm, then cool, as they let the wind take them downtown at eight o'clock. They felt the wings on their fingers and elbows flying, then, suddenly plunged in new sweeps of air, the clear autumn river flung them headlong where they must go. Oh, this is so evocative of, of youth and just like wandering around town. Yeah. Oh my God. I can't remember if it, because I, I went through a period of time where I read a lot of Ray Bradbury in like my late teens and early 20s. Mm -hmm. And uh, I can't remember if it's in this book or it might be in the book. It probably is in the one literally called Dandelion Wine, where mm -hmm. he just talks about the taste of summer and how you can capture the taste of summer in a bottle of dandelion wine. Like mm -hmm. just little moments of things that have definitely just throughout my whole life just influenced me in so many ways, so many small oh, yeah. ways. <sighs> Jim and Will grinned at each other. It was all so good, these blowing quiet October nights in the library waiting inside now with its green shaded lamps and papyrus dust. Jim listened. What's that? What, the wind? Like music? Jim squinted at the horizon. Don't hear no music. Jim shook his head. Gone. Or it wasn't even there. Come on. They opened the door and stepped in. Hey, what's they this stopped. book? It has a white and a black snake eating each other's tail on it. Huh. <laughs> <laughs> Turn around. Look at what you see. <laughs> God damn it. <laughs> <laughs> Never read the story. All right. <laughs> that was a lot. They opened the door and stepped in. They stopped. The library deeps lay waiting for them. Out in the world, not much happened, but here, in the special night, a land bricked with paper and leather, anything might happen, always did. Listen, and you heard ten thousand people screaming so high, only dogs feathered their ears. What? A million folk ran toting cannons, sharpening guillotines. Chinese, four abreast, marched on forever. Invisible, silent, yes, but Jim and Will had the gift of ears and noses, as well as the gift of tongues. This was a factory of spices from far countries. Here, alien deserts slumbered. Up front was the desk where the nice old lady, Miss Watrous, purple stamped your books, but down off, but down off away were Tibet and Antarctica, the Congo. There went Miss Wills, the other librarian, through Outer Mongolia, calmly toting fragments of Peiping and Yokohama and the Celebes. Well down the third board... Way down the third book corridor, an oldish man whispered his broom along in the dark, mounding the fallen spices. Will stared. It was always a surprise, that old man, his work, his name. That's Charles William Halloway, thought Will. He smells like soup. <laughs> <laughs> like Campbell's chunky soup? He, he just has a distinctly soupy odor, man. I, I just I just want to take a minute to, to point out something about this writing. Mm. The sheer artistry of yeah. the, of the sentence whispered his broom along. It it like mm. simul well, and just well, well oh, I'm uh, sorry, uh, okay so like so it begins and you're like you're listening to the words and you're constructing the the message and you mm -hmm. get to whispered so you think of talking and then almost like a joke you know like a like a, like a punchline. It directs it a different direction. So it tickles your brain, but you also simultaneously relate precisely to that description of a broom right. sweep. It, mm -hmm. Well, and just like having been kind of a young, socially isolated nerd walking into a library and just books in every direction. Oh, yeah. Like that, that, mean, that fucking description just 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 sang. Yeah. And you, I mean, you can smell it. Yeah. Absolutely. The, the smell of books, pages, old pages and leather. And there is nothing in the world that smells like a library. Mm -hmm. 
uh, papyrus dust. That was so good. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It was always a surprise. That old man, his work, his name. That's Charles William Halloway, thought Will. Not grandfather. Not far-wandering ancient uncle, as some might think, but my father. So looking, so looking back down the corridor, was Dad shocked to see he owned a son who visited this separate 20,000 fathoms deep world? Dad always seemed stunned when Will rose up before him, as if they had met a lifetime ago, and one had grown old while the other stayed young, and this fact stood between. He also drank on the job. <laughs> surprised by a lot of things. Explains the soup smell. He yeah. just has a brown bag he carries with him. Yeah. I need my four roses. Um, I, I do need to point out the, the fact that this was an economy where you could raise a family on being a library janitor. Right. Yeah, that's, that's never going to work anymore. No. <laughs> no. Far off, the old man smiled. They approached each other carefully. Is that you, Will? Grown an inch since this morning. Charles Halloway shifted his gaze. Jim? Eyes darker, cheeks paler. You burn yourself at both ends, Jim? Heck, said Jim. No such place as heck, but hell's right here under A for Allegory. Allegory's beyond me, said Jim. Ah, oh, so good. Yeah, that was that was good. <laughs> Just yeah, the, the, the like the comment of you, you grew an inch taller. It snapped me back to my childhood. <laughs> <laughs> And, and just, just that little bit of poetry of Alighieri allegory mm -hmm. was so good. How stupid of me. Dad laughed. I mean, Dante. Look at this. Pictures by Mr. Doré showing all the aspects. Hell never looked better. Here's souls sunk to their gills in slime. There's someone upside down, wrong side out. Boy, howdy. Jim eyed the pages two different ways and thumbed on. Got any dinosaur pictures? Dad shook his head. That's over in the next aisle. He strolled them around and reached out. Here we are. Pterodactyl, kite of destruction. Or what about drums of doom, the saga of the thunder lizards? Pep you up, Jim? <laughs> I don't know why I just pronounced that word saga, but I whatever. I thought about it, but I figured it was a creative <laughs> choice and let it happen. Or, <laughs> or, or how about this, Jim? The legend of the reptilians. <laughs> the lizard people that live in the center of the earth and run things. That's right. Here, this is about the the, uh, the fucking Windsors. <laughs> Be careful, kiddo. The left wing media—they're out to get you. <laughs> Pep you up, Jim? I'm pepped. Dad winked at Will. Will winked back. They stood now, a boy with corn-colored hair and a man with moon-white hair. A boy with a summer apple, a man with a winter apple face. Oh my god. Dad, dad, thought Will, why, why he looks like me in a smashed mirror. Oh my god. And suddenly Will remembered nights rising at two in the morning to go to the bathroom and spying across nights town. Nights in white satin. To see that one single light in the high library window. And no dad had lingered on late, murmuring and reading alone under these green jungle lamps. And then he passed in front of the window with his brown bag again. <laughs> <laughs> it made Will sad and funny to see that light, to know the You've old man. You've been hitting the booze again, dad. <laughs> he stopped to change the word. His father was here in all this shadow. Will, said the old man, who was also a janitor, who happened to be his father. What about you? Huh? Will shook himself. You need a white hat or a black hat book? Hats, said Will. Well, Jim, they perambulated, Dad running his fingers along the book spines. He wears the black ten-gallon hats and reads books to fit. Middle name's Moriarty, right, Jim? Really? I, I hope that's true. Yeah. Like James Moriarty Nightshade? <laughs> it, 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 it sounds like a, now it sounds like a character in someone's fan fiction, but. Right. But, I mean, that's the most delightfully edgy name ever. It's super good. <laughs> and it was in 1962. Uh-huh. Yeah, like, name, names were, uh, had, a, had a bit of an antique kind of edge to them back then. I mean, at the that time, they, they, were... had, they had a present edge, because 
of how time works <laughs> in, in, a, in a linear fashion. Joe, I'm specifically a three-dimensional being with a three-dimensional mind. That doesn't, like, the only point of true relevance to the universe is my perspective. Everything is now. Yeah, now. So you're it, it is always too? the present. Now. 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 What, I think what about broke. now? What about then? How about what's coming? Oh, God, it's catching. <laughs> oh, God, there's a cat on my chest. Get it off. Happening. Get it what off. This? <gasps> it's hard to, like... You don't need all of your oxygen. It's really hard to pick on this book. Like I know. Like I, I'm, like, so I'm good. quipping. Because like, like, I'm just thinking of funny things to say. But it, it is. It's so hard. It's such a good book. I really so think good. at this point, instead of shitting on the book, we should just talk about how as punishment for his shitty politics, he had a stroke and half his face stopped working later in his life. (laughs) (laughs) There you go. Brain worms listeners. This book was written by a Hatsuna Miku in 2010. (sighs) All right. Good writing. Well, Jim, they perambulated dad running his fingers along the book spines. He wears the black ten-gallon hats and reads books to fit. Middle name's Moriarty, right, Jim? Any day now, he'll move up from Fu Manchu to Machiavelli here, medium-sized dark fedora, or over along to Dr. Faustus, extra-large black Stetson. That leaves the white hat boys to you, Will. Here's Gandhi. Next door is St. Thomas. And on the next level, Jim, your dad still talks a lot of bullshit, doesn't he? (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> <laughs> he's drunk just just let him go yeah i had canon accepted that jim's dad is just a like raging alcoholic and jim just hasn't or will's dad i guess yeah oh right yeah will's dad is a raging alcoholic and will just hasn't grown up enough to recognize what those signs right. are he's still got some of his childhood yeah but he's like a yeah. jolly alcoholic yeah, yeah i was about to i was yeah, yeah. The same thing. Well, he's not a raging. charming drunk well, well yeah. like it, it's gotten to the point where um like he like he could be drinking straight vodka all day and he won't get drunk but if he stops he'll die <laughs> <laughs> yeah it's like right. archer yeah you don't mind said will i'll settle for the mysterious island what asked jim scowling is all this talk about white and black hats. Why, Dad handed Jules Verne to Will. It's just, a long time ago, I had to decide myself which color I'd wear. So, said Jim, which did you pick? Dad looked surprised, then he laughed uneasily. Since you need to ask, Jim, you make me wonder. Will, tell Mom I'll be home soon. Get out of here, both of you. Miss Watrous! He called softly to the librarian at the desk. Dinosaurs and mysterious islands coming up. The door slammed. His father then asked, Are you boys traveling men? (laughs) You ever been in the cockpit of an airplane before? The door slammed. Outside, a weather of stars ran clear in an ocean sky. Heck, Jim sniffed north. Jim sniffed south. Where's the storm? That darn salesman promised. I just got to watch that lightning fizz down my drain pipes. <laughs> <laughs> I, I've had days like that, let me tell you. Uh... Will let the wind ruffle and refit his clothes, his skin, his hair. Then he said faintly, It'll be here. By morning. Who says? The huckleberries all down my arms. They say. Great. The wind your blew Jim away. <laughs> A similar kite. concerned by how much Jim wants his house to burn down. <laughs> yeah, it's a little... I mean, he's obviously very black hat. Very sure. black hat. And, like, admittedly, this was this was a different time in terms of, like, oh, that... Moriarty that Nightshade. You know, but, like, he, he would be... He'd be wearing a black trench coat to school 40 years later, is all I'm saying. Oh, yeah. I mean, there is a reason why, at 15, when I read this book, I I can remember being very very fond of Jim Nightshade. Sure. Like, I... Can anyone explain to me the white and black hat comments? Haven't you ever watched a Western? Yeah, that's all you need. Yeah, the like... The good guys wear the white hats, and the bad guys wear the black hats. Mm-hmm. Right. Ah. 
Oh. You know, it's been some time since I've read it, but what I believe the story is setting up is like, do you, are you, you know, do you want to do right or do you want to do wrong? Right. Holy shit. And then Kane's going to have opinions. But can you imagine if David Lynch did an adaptation of this book? Oh my God. Yeah. It would be a yeah. giant pile of shit. Uh, <laughs> I think you're wrong there. And I just uh, yeah. want you to know oh that. Oh my God. Yeah. It would just be fucking awful. Instead of it being a cohesive story about an evil carnival, it would just be on the different makers of hats. And <laughs> then you would fucking time travel into an era when the hat was invented but it wouldn't really clear up. Like it wouldn't be straight about it. And then there would be a, a little person talking backwards. <laughs> and then there would be uh, a character would turn into a different character and then mm -hmm. turn back into the original character. Yeah. It would be a giant pile of shit. And I'm glad <laughs> that it's not going to happen. Someday I need to watch a David Lynch movie. You do. We'll make that happen for you. Maybe they could have Kyle MacLachlan play dad. <laughs> Because he's an old man now, and that should make everyone sad. No, it's David Lynch. He's yeah, going to be Jim yeah. Nightshade. <laughs> <laughs> that was a that was a roller coaster of a conversation. Was it, was. it though? It was. It just went all over the all over the shop. I think we were making up for all of the quips we haven't made. I mean, I can go on a tear for a while about how David Lynch isn't a great filmmaker. No, it's it's fine. You've made your point. No, no. I mean, let's do it. Let's talk about the fact <laughs> that the book. he makes fucking art films to some extent. They're terrible, but pretentious assholes. Laud oh, he's just great. It's amazing. Yeah, that's exactly what it is. <laughs> so in um, the interest of, uh, and I, I, I enjoy <laughs> David Lynch. Mm -hmm. um, I think that uh, Chris does need to watch. Absolutely. We'll make that happen. At least something so that he mm -hmm. can have an opinion on the subject. Mm -hmm. Um Clearly, Kane is a Lynch hater. <laughs> Here's a question for, for the podcast and, and the listeners, I guess, if you want to post in the comments. If you could only choose between these two binary options, what would it be? Would you rather be liked by a general populace or would you have a, like a smaller group that loves the hell out of you and another smaller group that hates the fuck out of you? <laughs> it's a good question. It is. And it one is. that's ongoing, and you should probably read Machiavelli. Um, <laughs> but I have a, a separate question, since we've determined that this is, in fact, a very well-written book. Yes. Oh, yeah. Um, Do we want to leave it, maybe leave it off and let the listeners... Well, no. I think um, I, I'm i kind of considering jumping forward. I oh, think yeah. you should. Because we just finished chapter two, and I think it would be interesting to maybe read... Like the first chapter in the second section. Yeah, absolutely. And then maybe jump toward the end. Just to get a feel throughout the book. Yeah, whatever but, whatever has us reading more of the book is okay with me. Right, right. All I want to say is, is that because this is such a good book, mm -hmm. we should definitely give the opportunity for readers to like... Let's try to pick things that won't spoil yeah, the I'm story Yeah, I'm not going to read the uh, final chapter of the final book, but I thought I might read the first chapter of, like, section two, book two, whatever. Okay, sure, yeah. I'll and then the That's first cool. chapter of the third section. And we can also that just, just great. put a, a spoiler warning. I mean, honestly, <laughs> like, it's it's implied, but yeah, I'll, I will put a spoiler <laughs> warning in the description. Chapter 25. She could feel the mirrors waiting for her in each room, much the same as you felt without opening your eyes, that the first snow of winter has just fallen outside your window. Miss Foley had first noticed some years ago that her house was crowded with bright shadows of herself, best then to ignore the cold sheets of December ice in the hall, above the bureaus, in the bath, best skate the thin ice lightly. Paused, the weight of your attention might crack the shell. Plunged through the crust, you might drown in depth so cold, so remote, that all the past lay carved in tombstone marbles there. The one, like, I don't even know if it's a criticism. I guess it's just a comment about, about Ray Bradbury's writing, specifically as, as evidenced by this. Sometimes the metaphors and similes get so thick that you have to stop and go, what, what am I looking at? Right, yeah. It's, which, it's, which I don't know if that's a flaw, but it's it's interesting. I the I, way that he builds a scene, yeah, is um, 
it's by putting your attention on all of these tiny little details. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's almost, it feels like looking at an impressionist painting. Sure. Absolutely. Yeah. You know, it's, it's the literary equivalent of a Monet. Mm -hmm. I just... dig the hell out of it. Cause like, I have no idea what's happening, but I like, I am feeling so many things. Yeah. Oh, sure. Yeah. We jumped straight to chapter 25 from chapter two. And I am and engaged. Mm -hmm. Opened with a character that we have no idea who the hell it even is. And yet immediately, immediately pulled in. Yeah. yeah. We're experiencing their inner world so vividly. Transfixed at the mirror sill, you would stand forever, unable to lift your gaze from the proofs of time. I think you're just disassociating. <laughs> yet tonight. With the echo of the running feet of the three boys dying away, she kept feeling snowfall in the mirrors of her house. She wanted to thrust through the frames to test their weather, but she was afraid that doing this might cause all the mirrors to somehow assemble in billionfold multiplications of self. An army of women marching away to become girls, and girls marching to become infinitely small children. So many people crammed in one house would provoke suffocation. Oh my god, what must so she do? Fucking good. Good. It's so, so good. fucking good. <laughs> so what must she do about mirrors? Will Halloway, Jim Nightshade, and the nephew. Strange. Why not say my nephew? Because, she thought, from the first when he came in the door, he didn't belong. His proof was not proof. She kept waiting for what? Tonight. The carnival. Music, the nephew said, that must be heard. Rides that must be ridden. Stay away from the maze where winter slept. Swim around with the carousel where summer, sweet as clover, honey grass, and wild mint kept its lovely time. She looked out at the night lawn from which she had not yet retrieved the scattered jewels. Somehow, she guessed this was a way the nephew had of getting rid of the two boys, who might stop her using this ticket she took from the mantle. Carousel. Admit one. She had waited for the nephew to come back. With time passing, she must act on her own. Something must be done not to hurt, no, but slow down interference from such as Jim and Will. No one must stand between her and nephew, her and Carousel, her and lovely gliding right around summer. Some golem vibes going on here. <laughs> yeah. The nephew had said as much by saying nothing by just holding her hands and breathing baked apple pie scent from his small pink mouth upon her face. She lifted the telephone. Across town, she saw the light in the stone library building, as all the town had seen it over the years. She dialed. A quiet voice answered. She said, Library? Mr. Halloway? This is Miss Foley, Will's teacher. In ten minutes, please, meet me in the police station. Mr. Halloway? A pause. Are you still there? I believe that's all of chapter 25. Nice. Yeah. What an interesting chapter. Um, it was. So, with a little extra time here, I'm going to jump into the next chapter. And that's immediately, again, you know, jumping in completely out of mm -hmm. context, but just immediately hooked and wanting to read the next chapter. Right. That's... This is such a different experience from most of the things that we read. It's novel. <laughs> it's nice to actually enjoy what we're... Yeah, yeah I'm like... just... I'm listening. In fact, yeah. there's been a couple of times where where Joe or someone will, like, make a comment, and I'm annoyed. Like, they're <laughs> interrupting. <laughs> they're interrupting the story time. And I'm like, motherfucker, shut up. Here, here's the thing. We, we have to talk and interrupt because otherwise legally we we might get sued by ray bradbury right State. right and we do not want that he was a terrible person he was <laughs> <laughs> so we have to transform the world. <laughs> otherwise i would just sit um the last thing that i listened to in, ter in terms of like our editing process was the castlevania mm -hmm. four and just mm -hmm. going from that to this it's <sighs> i know the the fucking dog shit writing that we read on this show 
and then and then there's this if if i may and this is this is gonna be a like a a a very forward statement but it's enlightening like i had no idea words could be put together like this (laughs) Mm -hmm. yeah welcome to ray bradbury like uh, all of his work is it's not all as good as this there is a reason why this is one of his like well-known works Mm. and his early stuff is fairly like baseline dime even though it shows a lot of promise it's fairly like this is a book you could have bought in the 60s about oh yeah I, i don't remember what it's called but there's a book that he wrote when he was very young it may even have been his first novel that was published mm-hmm. later in his life. Mm-hmm. And I, I read it probably around, I don't know, 98 or the year 2000, something like that. Um, right. But it was a detective novel and he had set out specifically trying to write something that was in the vein of Raymond Chandler and good Lord, just, I, I, I can't remember anything about the book except that the entire experience of reading it was just delightful. I'll have to read that. Uh, Raymond Chandler is one of my favorite writers. Yeah. Uh, I will absolutely have to check out his detective stuff. Yeah. And he may have only written the one, but like apparently I remember reading, I remember more about the foreword than I do about the story itself. Um, Mm -hmm. And in the foreword, he talks about, how when he first started writing, it was people like Chandler who really fired him up and got him inspired to be a writer. And so nice. he, you know, really kind of set out wanting to write those sorts of things. And he wrote this one and the book kept trying to steer itself into a different direction. And he learned so much about himself as a writer and just the sort of things that he needed to do. And golly. just Yeah. <laughs> Um, he wrote a short story called Rust that that I love to this day. It's so good. But he also had very problematic opinions. So he you did. Know, that's but, but but it doesn't matter. I guess but he did. He he is dead. Yeah, he is. He's dead. very dead, and he he left behind this legacy of of words that honestly, and you know, I'm I'm a strong advocate for death of the author. Sure. To begin, I with. mean, fuck, David Bowie was a pedophile, and yeah, yeah. wait, what? fucking salvador dolly was a literal fascist so mm-hmm, mm-hmm. david bowie was a pedophile yeah yeah when he was uh in his probably 30s he was sleeping with like 14 and 15 year old girls oh mm-hmm. i did not know that because that was just a time in rock and roll sure and, yeah uh, i mean just was the done thing which is not a defense it's just no like, no you know, no no but it, it's context Mm-hmm. Not not that context justifies it also. It's just... Yeah. You know, like I said that as an explanation and immediately <laughs> felt like it was a problem. Yeah, it was. It's kind of like me That's saying... not you know, what I was trying to do. It's kind of like me saying, you know, Ray Bradbury was a product of his time. It's true right. and it's an explanation, but it's not a justification. Well, I think yeah. this is something that everyone on the planet should ponder, especially. Um, you You can take a snapshot of someone at their best and take a snapshot of someone at their worst. And how do these two things exist in the same person? Ponder that and come up with an answer for yourself. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And, you know, always keep in mind that you're generally just something that people do psychologically seems to be giving other people the benefit of judging them at their best while simultaneously judging yourself at your worst. So cut yourself a break. That too. Yeah, but uh, fuck Morrissey. I mean, don't, don't, you know, don't be super rich. <laughs> right. No. And denounce white supremacy, clearly. Right. Clearly and, and unambiguously. Yeah, I denounce white supremacy. Yes. The, the, uh, this podcast ad, and, and everyone who associates with it says, hey, uh, white supremacy is bad. Don't, don't have it or do it. It's no good. Yeah. Chapter 26. <laughs> there was something quaint about that. Yeah. That was very charming. You're just your tone. <laughs> I'd have sworn, said one intern, when we first got here, that old man was dead. The ambulance and the police car had pulled up at the same moment at the crossroads, going back into town. One of the interns had called over. Now one of the policemen called back. You're joking. The interns sat in their ambulance. They shrugged. Yeah, 
Sure. Joking. They drove on ahead, their faces as quiet and white as their uniforms. The police followed, with Jim and Will huddled in back, trying to say more. But the police started talking and laughing, retelling everything that happened to one another. So Will and Jim wound up lying, giving wrong names again, saying they lived around the corner from the police station. They let the police drop them at two dark houses near the station, and they ran up on those porches and grabbed the doorknobs and waited for the prowl car to swing off around the corner into the station. And then they came down and followed and stood looking at the yellow lights of the station all sun-colored at midnight, and Will glanced over and saw the whole evening come and go in Jim's face, and Jim watching the police station windows as if at any moment darkness might fill every room and put the lights out forever. On my way back into town, thought Will, I threw away my tickets, but look, Jim still has his in his hand. They're golden tickets. Will trembled. What did Jim think, want, plan, now that dead men lived and only lived through the fire of white hot electric chair machines? Did he still very much love carnivals? Will searched. Faint echoes, yes, they came, they went in Jim's eyes, for Jim, after all, was Jim. "'even standing here with the calm light of justice falling on his cheekbones. "'The chief of police,' Will said. "'He'd listen to us.' "'Yeah,' said Jim. "'He'd wake just long enough to send for the butterfly net. "'Hell, William, hell! "'Even I don't believe what's happened the last twenty-four hours. "'But we gotta find someone higher up. that feeling. "'Keep trying. "'Now we know what the score is. "'Okay, what's the score? "'What's the carnival done is so bad?' Scared a woman with a mirror maze? So she scared herself, the police would say. Burgled a house? Okay, where's the burglar? Hiding inside an old man's skin? Who'd believe that? Who'd believe an old, old man was ever a boy twelve? What else is the score? Did a lightning rod salesman disappear? Sure, and left his bag. But he could have left town. That dwarf in the sideshow. Fuck, it is a David Lynch story. (laughs) <laughs> what irony would it be for a, a lightning rod salesman to be killed by being uh, struck by lightning? Um, I mean, not actually any more ironic than anyone else being yeah, struck this, by and, lightning. And despite what Atlantis Morissette tells you, that's not what irony is. But it would be mighty coincidental. It would. Don't you think? <laughs> um, also, wait, David, wait, I, I think you managed to read the one chapter that's just a spoiler for the entire fucking book. <laughs> <laughs> Joe, would you explain the Alana Mor what what was that called? Alanis Morissette. Are you not familiar with the song Ironic Isn't by Alanis Morissette? Chris missed a lot of pop culture. Don't you think? A little too ironic. It's like rain on your wedding day. So did, or a did free I free ride when you're already late? Was that a was that a quip it's or the did good I advice actually that you came, just didn't take? Came, please. Who would have Who thought? thought oh my God. It figured. <laughs> Are we just doing this for the rest of the episode? No, I just okay. He wanted he wanted to know. So okay, so wait, did I did I genuinely use ironic incorrectly or yes? Okay, but but, but it's not your fault. That's a very like popular definition. Yeah, there, there of, are mul- of irony. so there are multiple definitions of irony. There are de- multiple types of irony. Mm-hmm. Um, <clears throat> dramatic irony would in fact sort of fall under the auspices of what people typically think of as oh golly that's ironic that's fair um and that's just setting up something and then subverting the expectations right so um when things go in a way that you would not expect them to based on previous assumptions that's irony Mm -hmm. dramatic irony yeah well just irony in general is Okay, so I... Okay, I I gotcha. Yeah. um, Everything has gone in this way forever. Boy, I sure wasn't expecting the uh, rain to hit today. You know, that. Yeah. It's, Mm -hmm. yeah. Um, Okay. It's a reasonably complicated, like... Yeah, the the question is, what is irony? Yeah. Yeah. So, Actually, the most ironic thing about the uh, the song "Ironic" is that none of the things that she points out and uses in that song technically count as irony, true. and that fact itself is ironic. 
So the the irony being is that <laughs> with a song title, it's setting up the precedent that it's going to be a song about irony, but nothing in well, it the, is the, ironic. The song doesn't know that. The, but that's what that's what the setup is. Yeah. Also, are are we going to cut this out, or is this like discussion that? No, the, this is no, no, this is all this, this stays in. This is, yeah. Um, okay. Because, like, yeah, I, I could talk about this for a while. I, I just didn't sure. want to cut in on. <laughs> no, no, you're good. That's what we're here for. All right. So, with this being a spoilery chapter, I mean, the genie's out of the bottle. I guess I should go ahead and continue with it. Yeah, yeah keep doing what you're doing. Right on. So, we we stopped at a dwarf right there mm-hmm. at the end of the episode or whatever. Because yep. um, this is, in fact, Lynchian now. It's just yeah. headcanon well, accepted. Yep, yep. I'm here for it. That dwarf in the sideshow. I saw him. You saw him. Looks kind of like the lightning rod man. Sure. But again, can you prove he was ever big? No. Just like you can't prove Cougar was ever small. So that leaves us right here, Will, on the sidewalk. No proof except what we saw in us just kids. The carnival's word against ours. And the police had a fine time anyway there. Oh gosh, it's a mess. If only... Only there was still some way to apologize to Mr. Cougar. Apologize, Will yelled. To a man-eating crocodile? Jehoshaphat! <laughs> you still don't see we can't do business with those Almers and Goffs. Almers? Goffs? Jim gazed upon him thoughtfully, for that was how the boys talked of the creatures who dragged and swayed and slumped through their dreams. In the bad dreams of William... The Almers moaned and gibbered and had no faces. In the equally bad dreams of Jim, the Goffs, his particular name for them, grew like monster meringue paste mushrooms which fed on rats, which fed on spiders, which fed, in turn, because they were large enough, on and cats. Reeled and jiggled and tickled inside her. Almers! Goffs! said Will. You need a ten-ton safe to fall on you? Look what happened to two folks already, Mr. Electrico and that terrible crazy dwarf. All kinds of things can go wrong with people on that darn machine. We know, we've seen it. Maybe they squashed the lightning rod man down that way on purpose, or maybe something went wrong. Fact is, he wound up in a wine press anyway, got run over by a steamroller carousel and so's crazy now and doesn't even know us. Ain't that enough to scare the Jesus out of you, Jim? Why... Maybe even Mr. Cressetti. Mr. Cressetti's on vacation. I don't know what cheese has to do with being afraid. I am am afraid of cheeses. Many cheeses. Cheeses rice. (laughs) Cheeses is just all right by me. (laughs) Cheeses are delicious. (laughs) (laughs) Could you give me a tattoo of cheeses weeping? (laughs) Yes. Cheeses wept. I mean, that'd be a great tattoo for yeah, like your your dominant masturbatory arm. Just the baby Jesus crying. <laughs> what? Oh, you live I in a strange world. <laughs> yes, strange I, I world. It took me a solid couple <laughs> seconds, but but I did figure out what was going on <laughs> in the weird rusty clockwork that you call a brain. <laughs> <laughs> maybe yes, maybe no. There's his shop. There's the sign closed on account of illness. What kind of illness, Jim? He'd eat too much candy out at the show? He'd get seasick on everybody's favorite ride? Cut it, Will. No, sir, I won't cut it. Sure, sure the merry-go-round sounds keen. You think I like being 13 all the time? Not me. But for cry yi, Jim, face it. You don't really want to be 20. What else we talked about all summer? Talk, sure, but throwing yourself head first in that taffy machine, getting your bones pulled long, Jim, you wouldn't know what to do with your bones then. <laughs> I don't know what to do with I... my bones now. <laughs> yeah. It's it's a it's an ongoing complaint. Yeah. What well Joe, you need better bones? ones anyway. Yeah. Do you ever just like look at yourself? Like I have so many bones. That's <laughs> so many bones. Yeah. No, I mean no, I've, actually, I've never had that problem. The Insurance companies would like us to believe that we have some luxury bones. <laughs> yeah. I, uh, I feel like I need all of them. And <sighs> I've, I've tried to learn what to do with them as well as I can. I've got a luxury bone for insurance companies. <laughs> nice. You, you, 
You are a special boy. <laughs> I did it. I made a joke, guys. <laughs> Such a weird little man. Why are you? Why are you so weird? I don't know why I keep doing that voice. I just started doing it in cool stuff. <laughs> I'd know, said Jim in the night. I'd know. Sure, you'd just go away and leave me here, Jim. Why, protested the other, I wouldn't leave you, Will. We'd be together. Together? You two feet taller and going around feeling your leg and arm bones? You looking down at me, Jim, and what did we talk about? Me with my pockets full of kite string and marbles and frog eyes, and you with nice, clean, and empty pockets and making fun. Is that what we'd talk? Don't and carry frog able eyes to run in your faster That's and gross. ditch me. What's that? Don't carry frog's eyes in your pocket. That's gross. Yeah, that's probably a bad idea. Like or, that's... or depending. Well, sometimes you have to cast a spell and it requires material components. That's right? fair. So yeah. you keep that the fucking frog's eyes. Well, right? not just that, fabric. but eyes have loads of electrolytes in them. If you're dying, do. eat yeah. eyes. It's true. Like a little fruit snack. Hmm. Only it's eyes. Well, despite the aqueous humor, eyes are notoriously <laughs> difficult to make jokes about. I don't know if I'd say <laughs> <Damn> that. <it. laughs> How how is this show wildly unsuccessful? <laughs> With jokes like that. Netflix. Where's our special? Come on. Come on. That's quality content right Fax there. the contract over. I'd never ditch you, Will. Ditch me in a minute. Well, go on, Jim. Just go on and leave me because I got my pocket knife and there's nothing wrong with me sitting under a tree playing mumbledy peg while you get yourself playing crazy with the heat of all those horses racing around. But thank God they're not racing anymore. And it's your fault, cried Jim. He stopped. Will stiffened and made fists. You mean I should have let young, mean, and terrible get old, mean, and terrible enough to chew our heads off? Just let him ride around as Hawk is spit in our eye? And maybe you with him, waving goodbye, going around again, waving so long? And all I gotta do is wave back, Jim? That's what you mean? Shh, said Jim. Like you say, it's too late. The carousel's broke. And when it's fixed, they ride old, horrible cougar back, make him young enough so he can speak and remember our names. And then they come like cannibals after us, or just me, if you want to get in good with them and go tell them my name and where I live. I wouldn't do that, Will. Jim touched him. On. Oh, Jim. Jim, you do see, don't you? Everything in its time. Like the preacher said only last month. Everything one by one, not two by two. Will you remember? Everything, said Jim, in its time. Kiss him. In its right place. Kiss him. And then they heard voices from the police station. In one of the rooms to the right of the entrance, a woman was talking now, and men were talking. I will say that uh, one of the, like, it works and it, it captures the characters fairly well, but it's not the best dialogue. No, the the, the dialogue is not nearly as strong yeah, as the, his, the descriptions and the, yeah. His prose is incredible. Right. Um, the dialogue gets you there. Mm-hmm. And I mean, it does capture, I suppose, a particular sort of dialect of. Yeah, like that's why I started doing that stupid voice because I could hear those characters talking like that. <laughs> oh, sure. <laughs> Will nodded to Jim and they ran quietly over to pick their way through bushes and look into the room. There sat Miss Foley. There sat Will's father. Mick Foley, the wrestler? <laughs> no, no. Different, different. <laughs> oh, he's mankind. actually like a pretty big feminist. Yeah. Really? Oh, yeah. Mick Foley, uh, he was like three different characters, wasn't he? He was like Mankind and... Cactus Jack. That's right, yeah. And uh, Brother Love. And also just Mick Foley. Yep. Uh, uh, I'm, I'm yeah, but no, he's... Here. I just knew that... Yeah, Mick name. Foley is absolutely a feminist. Uh-huh. Cactus Jack and an all-around is, great guy. Is my yeah. new porn star name. That's Is that because of all the spiky things hanging off your hangdong? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Your you should really get that looked at. You should really get that looked at. That's not... Yeah. I mean, are you a cat? No, it's my calling card. It's like the only way I got into the adult film industry. Does your dick it's look like, like an a Albert Cenobite? Fish thing? No, I think it's like an Albert Fish thing where he just pushed a bunch of needles oh, into right. his dick. Yeah. 
I'm but not going to name her on air, but a friend of mine once told me a story about uh, getting paid to do that to someone. Like he specifically paid her to stick pins into his genitals. Okay. Well, you know, as long yeah, as everybody I believe was, it. was there for it. Yeah. Yeah. yeah that's uh, that's a thing. Yeah. So Making look, I'm would, not here to I would accept him. money. I would absolutely accept money to put needles in people. Yeah. I will do that right now. In fact, if anybody out there is like, Hey, I, I just want this guy to come over and just stick needles in my junk. Yeah. I really uh, like the look of his feed picks. I just kind of want to take it to the next level. Dollar a needle. That's all I'm yep. saying. Dollar the only a pen. thing I would be worried about <laughs> is like permanently. You sell yourself someone. too short, sir. But yeah, beyond that, that, that is very inexpensive for that <laughs> service. Yeah. It's a hundred dollars a needle. And I've got experience pushing needles into people. It's true. It's true. That's, I mean, that's and why he's I'm also a tattooist. Him. That's the joke. JPEG. <laughs> yeah. Thanks for, for painting that picture for us, buddy. You're welcome. God, we're stupid. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> What did we just do? What, have, what is this? Where, where are, are we? The book, <laughs> is, just too the book good. is too well written. We it's can't, too good. Yeah. Usually we spend this time calling amateur writers and occasionally very professional writers um, assholes and mocking them. And we can't really comfortably do that with this book. I mean, we could call the writer an asshole. Yeah, because he's dead and you no can't hesitation. do anything about it. He's a, he's a <laughs> dead racist, but... We can't actually criticize this book on the level of literary criticism. No, because it's really fucking it's good. So good. <laughs> well, I mean, I think it's also important to keep in mind that uh, criticizing something doesn't always mean just tearing it to pieces. Like, you know, it's recognizing the good in it as well. And I bring it up from time to time. But, you know, something that we kind of want from this show is to help people understand how to write better. You know, we're, right. you know, we're not just, well, look at this dumb, bad book. Like we're actually discussing things about how writing should be done. Oh, and that's not why I came here. That's fine. Mm. I came here just to, to shit on poo poo writing. That's it. Sure. And, and, and that's and, valid. Yeah, that's valid. That's, that's also why we're here. But, um, I, I do think reading something that's so good and, and discussing why it's good is kind of valuable to that end. Yeah. Agreed. But also he's a dead racist. But also he's a dead racist. You know who's awesome? Hmm? Lamar Burton. LeVar Burton? Yeah, LeVar yes. Burton is LeVar awesome. Ver LeVar yeah. Burton is fucking fantastic. Super good. Super good, dude. You know who else is awesome? Hmm. Who's that? His daughter. <laughs> really? Yeah, she's real cool. She's a uh, she's a nerd. Giant nerd. She does like uh, video game and like D and D related stuff on the internet. Uh, Misha Burton is her mm -hmm. name. I will follow and up. I will follow her on Twitter is an out and proud. Uh, I don't remember if she identifies as pansexual or bisexual, but mm -hmm. uh, either way is Super openly cool. queer and nice. out and proud about it and is very well supported by her father, who is in fact, one of the best people on the planet. Fuck yeah. Um, <laughs> Wait, was LeVar Burton Jordy on yes, he was. And, and he was also, also the host of Reading Rainbow. Right, which you probably weren't allowed to watch because I literally wasn't. Yeah. That's Wow. That's Were like, you allowed you, you to probably... watch Bob Ross? No. Wow. Um, I kind of feel like A, we we're just wildly tangential now. And I feel like I the, mean we we've we've said everything that yeah, we can possibly I feel like the say about the book. we just had was a nice closing argument. Yep. Yeah. yeah. Um, um do, do we are we done here does anybody else have anything to add i'm really hungry so i'm gonna say we're done okay that's fair that's fair um i got something you can put in your mouth <laughs> it's, it's his genitals why do we have to telegraph all the jokes <laughs> <laughs> because it was obvious Kane. what i no. was implying Kane. it was obvious Kane. we didn't need you to fucking to spell it out joe <laughs> Kane, consider the kind of people who listen to our show no one. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> popular. Um, That's not true. Maybe it's because you are okay. not no one, no matter what Kane yes. says. All, <laughs> all maybe dozen of you who who actually do listen to this show, we're very grateful. Like we we joke, but we're actually really happy for everybody that does listen. 
um, you exist and you're valid and ignore Chris. Wait, it wasn't Aww. Chris, it was me. Oh, was I it you? It. You're all in It's just, yeah. Me. Yeah. I mean, you know, I'm, probably ignore I'm both Chris sure and Kane and right. Joe it, yeah. and me. Like, sometimes I'm probably not find sure better if this whole podcast isn't happening in my mind. <laughs> Technically, everything's happening in your mind. That's fair. Yeah. All of your, you know, in fact, David <laughs> commented to that end earlier today. Um, Consciousness is you telling you a story about you. You're just consenting to hallucinate reality. Are um, you consenting? That's fair. Yeah. Nobody asked. Is existence exist. consensual? No. That's ab- what I'd like to leave not. this on. <laughs> so, uh, uh, with that in mind, I would argue that it is. Oh. You can stop oh, existing if not, you want. That's true. true. We're not going down that rabbit hole at the end of the episode. So, oh, we um, did. It's already no, yeah, been wait. done. Okay. Yeah, okay. We uh, are hit, in that rabbit hole, no, sir. No, because hit, hit here's the what happens. Scream! Chris, hold on hit one second. Breaks. I'm sorry. We've done that before. We went on like a 30-minute fucking discussion about Stephen King at the end of the episode. It all got cut out in the edit. <laughs> yeah, all I'm saying is uh, we're, we're not going to go down that rabbit hole, rabbit hole here <laughs> live hole. recording. Mm-hmm. But it's but something interesting it that the, uh, the listeners... Yeah, you know, please right, well comment. Then let's is existence let's, consensual? Let's end the episode. We're we're very sorry. We're, we're, we're very so sorry. sorry. Um, I'm not. He's proud. He's proud of what we've done. Do what you want today. With that. Yeah, this book is great. Yeah, but Read you didn't it. write it. Yeah, but I'm still proud that we got to talk about it. That's true. Why am I going to apologize for introducing people to really good writing? That's fair. because we are the gatekeepers of that. We're not. <laughs> we're absolutely not the gatekeepers. Um, I'm not apologizing for that was an analogy. Writing. I am apologizing oh, for yeah. us talking over and around Ray yeah. Bradbury's writing. Yeah, we apparently there's legal reasons well, that no, we it's have not to about interrupt. That. I just <laughs> I just feel like we are awful and we owe people an apology. Yeah, it's true. Um, Man, why can't why can't we just like take other people's books, put them on our YouTube channel, and get views that way? Like, I just, it's so unfair. Because we'll get sued. Is why I know it's I, unfair. I would love to just be like David, read this for ninety minutes. And then just collect the YouTube money, but we really can't. Do. <laughs> you know, I would also love that. Um, that <laughs> someone would like to hire me as a personal, like, come and read things to you. My rates are very reasonable. I do charge more than I do for the pens, but you know that can be a side service if you're into that. Maybe during the a day. Dollar a pen. David, will, so how what, much you're doing would you five charge bucks? to come yeah. hammer nails into my balls? <laughs> while you read Tennessee or any Ford place. <laughs> uh, that's very specific. That is bizarrely specific, Joe. Just read the glass menagerie that is, and that hammer is... nails into my scrotum. Can you, can you sign us off, Joe? Can yeah, you... we should stop. I, I, I'm so hungry. <laughs> Let me go. If you like what we we do, if you want to interact with us or support us, all of those things can be found on our website. We give you brainworms.com. Thank you for listening. Don't be a fucking racist. Your boss is not your friend. And we're very sorry. And all cops are bastards. True. This has been a production of Brainworms Presents. Any copyrighted content contained within is used for purposes of review. Brainworms podcast is David Combs, Kane Magdalene, Christian Schaefer, and Joseph Wells. The theme music is HodgePod No. 1 by Brian Davis. If you like what you heard, you can support us and learn about our other projects at wegiveyoubrainworms.com or by leaving a review on your favorite listening app. <laughs>